Hello, everyone. Thank you for logging in today. I'm Deanne Wright, a member of the Board of Directors of the Scleroderma Research Foundation. It's an honor for me to be here today to introduce our special guest who joins us from the Johns Hopkins Scleroderma Center in Baltimore, Maryland. This is our 12th webinar in an ongoing series, and I'd like to remind everyone that each of our sessions can be viewed on our website at sclerodermaresearch.org. In addition to the webinar series, please be sure to browse our growing library of research and patient-related news, all available to you at no cost. We welcome your feedback and use it to help make our website and programs more useful for everyone in the scleroderma community. Of course, we also very much appreciate your support. The SRF depends upon charitable donations to speed progress toward a cure, so please consider making a gift after our time together today, either through our website or by calling us directly. Our webinar series is made possible by grants from Gilead Sciences, Metamune, and Novartis. Today's session will focus on the latest developments across the scleroderma treatment arena. In the next 40 minutes, we'll learn how clinicians are treating some of scleroderma's most pervasive symptoms and about the new therapeutics that research is helping to bring to patients. We'll then wrap up with about 15 minutes of question and answer time. Only the phone lines of our presenters have been unmuted, so if you have a question or comment, please use the chat box in the conference window. Remember that our webinars are for general information only and no information provided is to be considered personalized medical advice. Scleroderma affects everyone differently. No two cases are exactly alike. It is great to have you with us and it is my pleasure to introduce our special guest today. Dr. Laura Hummers is co-director of the Johns Hopkins Scleroderma Center, one of the largest and most highly respected such centers in the United States and one that the SRF is very proud to have played a key role in establishing as well as continuing to support. Dr. Hummers earned her MD degree from the University of Rochester School of Medicine and completed her internship and residency at Thomas Jefferson University with a postdoctoral fellowship at Johns Hopkins. Dr. Hummers is a physician scientist whose research focuses on identifying markers in the blood that could help predict outcomes for patients with scleroderma. She is also interested in understanding the natural course of the disease and in developing new treatments to help patients. It's a pleasure to introduce her today as she presents What's New with Scleroderma. Ladies and gentlemen, Dr. Laura Hummers. Hi, Deanne, and thank you very much for that very kind introduction. Can I, I hope everybody can hear me. Um, I first would like to thank the Scleroderma Research Foundation, uh, Lou Gebnan and Deanne Wright, for organizing and uh, presenting these webinars. I think this is a very effective format um, for education for patients, and I'm very happy to be participating with you today. Uh, and I would also like to welcome all of our participants participants today. Uh, I'm here in Baltimore today, and it's a wonderful sunny fall day, uh, and I hope you're all doing well. Uh, I thank you for your participation today in the webinar. I will try and monitor the messages for any pressing uh, questions or clarification points as I go along. Uh, but again, please be aware that there is time at the end of this session for questions, and we hope to have left about 15 minutes at the end of the session for questions. Um, for today's presentation, I wanted to give a broad overview of what's happening in scleroderma research, uh, but found that I really had to uh, limit our discussion today due to time uh, and not able to discuss some of the recent scientific advancements in scleroderma, uh, but would like to give an update on where things are with some clinical, clinical trials in several key areas in scleroderma. The areas I'd like to touch upon today include new vasodilator therapies for Raynaud's phenomenon. These are medications that help to improve blood flow. I would like to touch briefly on some information that I find is important uh, with regard to scleroderma kidney disease. Uh, a very large area of active clinical trials is pulmonary hypertension. Uh, there continue to be multiple new therapies uh, for pulmonary hypertension in general, and scleroderma patients have been, been included in all of the clinical trials. And I'd like to summarize some of the new uh, medications and discuss some areas where therapy in this area may be headed. 
uh, I would like to touch upon uh, an important study that is ongoing now for lung disease in scleroderma. This is fibrotic lung disease, and this is the scleroderma lung study 2. Uh, and then I would like to give an overview of some very active areas of treatment for early uh, diffuse skin disease. This includes agents that might be antifibrotic and some novel drugs that are in clinical trials. And while there isn't a large advancement in gastrointestinal disease in scleroderma, uh, I thought I would just touch briefly upon some information that we have about proton pump inhibitors. These are medications that we very commonly use to treat gastroesophageal reflux in scleroderma. Um, and I get questions a lot about the possible risks of these medicines, so I'd like to touch upon that. Uh, and just briefly mention some additional new potential therapies in GI disease. So I'm going to sc start by discussing Raynaud's phenomenon and some new therapies uh, that are under uh, trial currently. As you all know, Raynaud's phenomenon is uh, a condition that includes a vascular problem in the hands and feet uh, and affects almost every patient with scleroderma. Raynaud's phenomenon is defined by either cold-induced or stress-induced color changes of the skin in the hands and feet. Uh, and this can range from being a nuisance phenomenon to some patients uh, to a very dramatic uh, complication in some patients with scleroderma. The most prominent complication is the development of what we call digital ischemic ulcers. This means that this is a lack of blood flow leading to breakdown or, uh, of the skin in the digits um, in the fingers. Uh, and these lesions are incredibly painful, painful and can damage uh, the tissue. What we know about uh, what causes uh, Raynaud's phenomenon and this blood vessel problem in scleroderma is probably at a few different places. The smooth muscle is in the wall of your blood vessels, and this controls the tone or the spasm. Um, in the blood vessels. There are many factors that are circulating around that also control the tone of the blood vessels and can be involved in potentially damaging the blood vessels. And the blood vessels are also under control from the nervous system. And uh, impacting this area could also affect um, how we treat or manage Raynaud's phenomenon and ulcers. So the reason that this is important is that there are multiple ways that we could potentially uh, interrupt this process in scleroderma. Now, uh, you're not meant to understand all the abbreviations on this slide, but this is a picture of a blood vessel. And again, there are different layers of the blood vessel, and there are some things that are circulating around um, in our bloodstream that can impact what's happening in these blood vessel walls. And there are some things secreted from the cells within the blood vessel wall themselves that could impact, again, the tone or the spasm in the blood vessel walls. Now, there are multiple drugs that we think may impact Raynaud's phenomenon and then the consequences of Raynaud's phenomenon. And I'm going to talk about a few of them today. Um, so this NO stands for nitric oxide. And nitric oxide is a very strong what's called vasodilator, a substance that can open blood vessels. So it would be really important to try and increase this, and we can do this by a few ways. Directly try and uh, give a medication uh, that turns into this nitric oxide, or we can give medicines that, by different mechanisms, increase the amount of natural not nitric oxide uh, that's in the blood and around these blood vessels. And I'm going to talk about another group of medications called endothelin-1 inhibitors. Uh, these are most often used to treat pulmonary hypertension, but probably have some impact on the blood vessels in Raynaud's phenomenon as well. So I'm going to first talk about the group of medicines called phosphodiesterase inhibitors. Uh, this is the group of medicines uh, that includes sildenafil, um, sometimes also known as Viagra. And this was some information from the first study that was published using this kind of medication back in 2005, which suggested that patients who were receiving the medication, as noted by these gray bars, had less, less number of Raynaud's attacks, the length of Raynaud's attacks, 
and a score that we sometimes use in research called the Raynaud's Condition Score. Now this was a small study of 16 patients, but was the first one that suggested uh, that this type of medicine may be beneficial for Raynaud's. Subsequently, we've had some somewhat contradictory information about this class of medications. This is data from a trial uh, out of the University of Michigan uh, looking at a similar drug to sildenafil, a drug called Tadalafil. Scleroderma patients were enrolled in this study, were off of their treatment for Raynaud's, and then either given this medication or given a placebo for four weeks, and then they looked to see how their Raynaud's was impacted by this medication. These, again, were the three ways that they assessed someone's Raynaud's phenomenon by this Raynaud's condition score, the frequency of Raynaud's, and the duration of Raynaud's. And this study suggested that this medication did not have a significant impact on any of these measures. Subsequently, a study was presented at the American College of Rheumatology meeting looking at this same medication. Patients in this study were treated for a little bit longer, for eight weeks, and they were allowed to stay on their regular medications for Raynaud's phenomenon. And then some patients were randomized to have this medication to Dalafil add-on or add a placebo medication. This study suggested improvements in duration and frequency of Raynaud's attacks and in this Raynaud's condition score. And in the subset of patients who had ulcerations, uh, there seemed to be improvement in the healing where patients who were treated with this Tadalafil medication had fewer new ulcerations and improved healing compared to those who were getting the placebo or sugar pill. I will tell you that there are several other medications in this class that are either currently in trials or have recently completed trials. So hopefully these medications will give some clarity to whether this class of medicines is effective for Raynaud's phenomenon. And I'm going to discuss at the end of this section on Raynaud's phenomenon why we have trouble probably uh, determining whether some of these medications are effective. As I mentioned, another class of medications that can be used for Raynaud's phenomenon uh, are what's called the endothelin receptor antagonists. Uh, and just to briefly state what that means is that uh, endothelin is a very potent what's called vasoconstrictor. So this is something that circulates that can constrict blood vessels. And these medications work by blocking this. So the first drug to be studied for finger ulcers in scleroderma is the drug called Bosantin under the trade name Treclear. This is, again, this endothelin receptor antagonist. This medication is approved to treat pulmonary hypertension, is very commonly used to treat pulmonary hypertension. And this study underwent two very large studies in patients with scleroderma who have digital ulcerations. There were two studies that were completed, and about over 300 patients totaled were, uh, were examined in these studies. And they looked to see what happened with the ulcers. Um, in these studies, either at 16 or 24 weeks. Both of these studies suggested that there was a reduced number of ulcers, new ulcers that occurred in patients who were treated with this medication than in those who were getting a sugar pill. This led to approval of this medication in uh, Europe for this drug. Unfortunately, the FDA did not feel that this data was significant enough to uh, warrant approval here in the United States. But this was the first study of this class of medication that suggested perhaps is a medication that could impact the development of ulcerations in scleroderma. There is ongoing now a trial of a new endothelin receptor antagonist. Uh, we and many of the other scleroderma centers around the country have participated in this study, and there were actually two studies going on simultaneously, both of which are wrapping up enrollment currently. This study includes 285 patients, 75 centers, and 30 countries, and examines this new medication, which is Masintantin, which is, again, another one of these endothelin receptor antagonists. The difference about this one and what makes it different from the uh, Bosantin medicine is what's called its tissue targeting properties. This means that this medication is better able to penetrate into the tissues. 
And to be in this study, you have to have finger ulcers in, and have a history of ulcers in the past 6 to 12 months, which means you're somebody who has recurrently developed ulcers on your fingers. And then what we're measuring to see if this medication is effective is the number of new digital ulcers that somebody would develop at four months. We just finished um, enrolling this study, and this is some, a study which we may have um, some data from actually uh, fairly soon. So this is a ex uh, potentially exciting area. If this study shows similar or better results to the Bosantin study, it is possible that this medication may be able to be approved to treat ulcers in scleroderma. It is too soon yet to know. A third class of medications that are used to treat, that have been used to treat uh, scleroderma and ulcers and Raynaud's phenomenon have been prostaglandins. Prostaglandins are potent vasodilator medicines. Again, they work by opening blood vessels. And we have a fair amount of data um, to suggest that the various intravenous or IV preparations of these medications are probably effective uh, to treat Raynaud's and ulcers. But they're obviously limited by the fact that they are uh, given by IV, uh, so a little bit harder to uh, administer and access. Previous studies looking at oral prostaglandins uh, have not suggested significant benefits, and it was thought this was because these drugs are not as effective when given by mouth, uh, and they do not remain in your bloodstream very long, and that's probably why they haven't worked. There has been recently development of a new oral drug called oral triprostanil, which is being studied for both pulmonary hypertension and has been studied for scleroderma, associated Raynaud's, and ulcers. The original information suggested a very important thing, that we were able to get good levels of the medication in the bloodstream when given by pill. And again, this is something that had been lacking uh, with some of the previous oral preparations of this type of medication. This picture shows the blood flow in patients who are participating in this early study. The darker blue suggests lack of blood flow, and these brighter colors suggest improvement in blood flow, and this is somebody before and after treatment. This study then went into a larger trial with 148 scleroderma patients in 27 centers, and patients either received this drug or a placebo or sugar pill for 20 weeks. Unfortunately, this study suggested at 20 weeks there was no change in the ulcers uh, that patients had, either new ulcers or healing of prior ulcerations uh, compared to the sugar pill. However, there were other outcomes that improved, uh, including what the physician and the patients thought of the improvement during the duration of the study, the symptoms of Raynaud's phenomenon, and somebody's hand function due to ulcerations. These what's called secondary outcomes suggested that this drug may be beneficial, uh, and many of us who participated in this study uh, felt that the medication likely was probably having some effect. Um, there is some additional study that is going on now to look at this, to explore this further, uh, and hopefully we will know some more about this uh, in the coming year. This just graphically shows you uh, a measure of the ulcers during this trial not being significantly different between the two groups. This is a summary of some of the medications that we have to use uh, to treat Raynaud's phenomenon and importantly treating ulcerations. So we have many classes of medications that likely have some impact on Raynaud's and ulcers. Um, and for any given patient, any number of these could be tried. I think we will start to learn more about each of these individually, and there'll be new medications um, in each of these classes that will undergo further study. And it's possible that these medications, because they work slightly differently from each other, will be uh, used in combination, and we'll learn more about the combinations. I'd also like to mention here that this list looks fairly similar to a list that we could put together, uh, and I'll have later in the talk for pulmonary hypertension. And I think the scleroderma world has benefited greatly 
from the number of new medications that have been uh, studied and approved for pulmonary hypertension, and we are likely to have benefit from all of this, these additional drugs uh, with regard to Raynaud's phenomenon and digital ulcerations. So I think it's a probably very exciting time, and there's much more data to come for this. Now, I mentioned that there seems to be discrepancies in some of these trials. Some studies suggesting that they help, some studies suggesting that they don't help, uh, and there's probably lots of reasons for these discrepancies. Uh, probably much of it has to do with how we design these studies. Many of these studies look at patients with finger ulcers, and that's about half of the patients who have uh, scleroderma will get ulcers at some time during their disease. But as part of this study, we, the investigators, are asked to kind of rate and evaluate these ulcers. And how we do that could vary from person to person, uh, and this may be part of why these studies are so hard to do. So if you were to look at any given uh, finger ulcer, sometimes depending on the study, we are asked to decide, one, is this an ulcer or could this be some other complication of scleroderma? Sometimes that's very hard to distinguish. Is it what's called an active ulcer? Is this something that we think could respond or should respond to medications? How we define a healing or a healed ulcer is also somewhat complicated. So any of you who have had ulcerations know that it's, while the ulcers are painful for various reasons, sometimes it's hard for us, the investigators, to know uh, what exactly is happening uh, at, in these ulcers at any given moment in time. And this is probably a big part of the reason why these uh, medications are difficult to study. But again, this is a very active area and we are gonna, of research and we're going to have a lot more data about some of these medications in the next one to two years. I'm going to shift gears now and talk about another blood vessel problem in scleroderma, which is scleroderma kidney disease or renal disease. And this is a pathology uh, image of a blood vessel uh, in a patient who has scleroderma kidney disease. This should be a nice, hollow, open tube uh, blood vessel. And this blood vessel is blocked off by the scleroderma disease process in this blood vessel. I wanted to make a quick point about some of the new information we have about somebody's risk for developing scleroderma kidney disease. And I wanted to start that discussion by uh, introducing a concept of what's called phenotype. What phenotype means is an observable characteristic. And in the world of scleroderma, this phenotype could be either based on how much skin tightness there is. We often say limited or diffuse to define how much skin disease there is based on how much organ dysfunction there is, like how much or how little lung scarring there is, based on an antibody type. Those are all ways that we could subdivide or group uh, patients based on these characteristics. And we feel very strongly that if you can do this very accurately, this will help us determine how well somebody is going to do from their scleroderma, who is going to respond to some medications, and who's at higher risk for complications. Um, and hopefully in the future as we start to do this better and then we combine this with other markers such as what your genes are telling us, uh, what markers could be circulating in your blood, then we could even do this better in the future. Why is this important in scleroderma kidney disease? Because we know that depending on the antibody that you make as part of your scleroderma, and these are antibodies that are directed against proteins in your own cells. So that's what defines a uh, autoimmune disease is the presence of these antibodies. We know that depending on which one of these antibodies that you make, and some of the very common ones are ones called centromere, SCL70, and RNA polymerase, uh, and the names are not important, but they represent the proteins that are being targeted by these antibodies. We know that depending on which antibody that you make, your risk for developing scleroderma kidney disease can be dramatically different. How is that? When we look at risk factors for development of scleroderma kidney disease, we know that patients who have widespread skin disease, particularly those who have rapid progression and who are early in the disease, seem to have an increased risk for scleroderma kidney disease. 
But we now know, and in the United States now currently have an available test for this antibody called RNA polymerase 3, if you make this antibody, your risk goes from being in the probably 3 to 5 percent range for scleroderm overall to being somewhere in 25 to 30 percent risk of having this kidney problem happen. We, as doctors, find this very important. So if I know that somebody makes this antibody, I counsel my patients much differently in terms of watching for scleroderma kidney disease. Finding early scleroderma kidney disease is crucial in preventing there from being significant damage to the kidney. So we find this test to be very important. In terms of new information about scleroderma kidney disease, there has always, there's been a long-standing question and debate about whether the medications that we use to treat scleroderma kidney disease the so-called ACE inhibitor medications, should be used in all patients with scleroderma to prevent scleroderma kidney disease. We don't have much information about this, but we, the information that we have suggests that using these medications as a preventative strategy does not seem to improve uh, kidney function amongst those who develop scleroderma kidney disease. Uh, there was a group out of Canada who put together a web-based study to look and see if we could get some more clarity to this question and really set out to examine whether using ACE inhibitors before somebody develops kidney problems will change what complications they have from their kidney problem if they develop it. This study suggested that using these medications before somebody develops kidney problems was associated with worse outcomes, meaning um, worse kidney function at one year. Patients who had been given this ACE inhibitor medication beforehand um, were more likely to have a renal crisis with a normal blood pressure. So what does that mean? This means that it's possible that the ACE inhibitor medications are fooling us to missing the scleroderma kidney problem if it's happening. It is also possible that the patients who were getting this medication in advance were either sicker or developing kidney disease earlier, and this may account for the reason that we did not see that they did better, and in fact, we saw that they did worse. How do I interpret this data? I say that this data and the prior data that we have suggest that there is at least no benefit for using these medications ahead of time. Uh, so probably should not be given to all patients with scleroderma with the hopes of preventing scleroderma kidney disease. Uh, until we get more information, we probably should all um, practice that. This medication is definitely used to treat scleroderma kidney disease after it has begun. So the crucial thing for scleroderma kidney disease is that patients are aware of it. We can define groups who are at high risk and that patients are counseled to watch for this complication. And the way that they do that is by checking their blood pressure regularly. The third blood vessel problem I'm going to discuss in scleroderma is pulmonary hypertension. Pulmonary hypertension occurs as a result of abnormalities in the blood vessels in the lung. This leads to a stretch or strain on the right side of the heart and can lead to enlargement of the right side of the heart. One of the big things that we are learning about scleroderma pulmonary hypertension is that it is complicated. There are probably multiple reasons within scleroderma that somebody may develop this pulmonary hypertension one of which is that there is a problem fundamental to the blood vessels in the lungs, just like we see in patients who have what's called idiopathic pulmonary hypertension, people who don't have scleroderma who just have this pulmonary hypertension problem. This is the largest group that has been studied uh, in the drug trials for uh, pulmonary hypertension. But scleroderma patients, because they have a very similar blood vessel problem, uh, have also been included in the trials of these medications. This is a complicated slide which you don't need to understand other than there are multiple pathways that can affect, the, again, the tone of the blood vessels, very similar to the um, 
slide that I showed for Raynaud's phenomenon in ulcers in scleroderma, these are very similar pathways. Again, that either can reduce the amount of vasoconstricting medicines or can enhance the amount of these vasodilators. Again, the list is very similar to the drugs that I talked about for uh, Raynaud's phenomenon in ulcers. But this is an area where we have multiple approved therapies to treat scleroderma-associated pulmonary hypertension. So this has a been a very active area of research uh, leading to approval by the FDA um, and our European counterparts for medications to treat pulmonary hypertension. The classes of these medicines, again, are familiar. These are the endothelin receptor antagonists. And in the United States, there are two approved therapies, Traclear and Lateris. There's a third one that is, was approved uh, in Europe, uh, actually not approved uh, any longer. Again, there are new endothelin re receptor antagonists that are um, currently in trials. The prostanoid medicines that we talked about before, and there are multiple ways that these medications have been given. These medications, again, are hard to get into a pill form and have them be effective. So right now, the approved drugs are either given through an IV, either through the skin, or inhaled. And there are multiple of these that are approved. The phosphodiesterase inhibitors that we discussed previously, including sildenafil and tadalafil, approved to treat pulmonary hypertension. And actually, very recently, there's been a new class of medications called a soluble guanylate cyclase stimulant. Again, what that means is not important. Uh, but this is a class of medications that works similarly to the phosphodiesterase inhibitors. And this drug has just received uh, approval by the FDA to treat pulmonary hypertension. This may be another drug that we will have more information about with regard to Raynaud's and digital ulcers. But the studies that were used to approve this medication also included about 20% of patients uh, with scleroderma in this study. So this is likely to be approved to treat scleroderma-associated pulmonary hypertension as well. Where are things going in the future in terms of pulmonary hypertension medications? There is likely to be lots more information about com combining existing medications. There is going to continue to be the next generation of each of those existing types of therapies. Um, again, new endothelin receptor antagonists, new phosphodiesterase inhibitors. There is lots of new information coming in terms of new targets. So basically everything that we've looked at so far has been, again, either things that enhance vasodilators or suppress vasoconstricting uh, proteins. There's lots of research looking at new possible targets uh, that are not one of these classes. And these are a few of the new areas of study. And we are learning more about new patient groups in scleroderma, and this is going to be an area that is very important in scleroderma. All of these drugs are treating patients who have a specific subtype of pulmonary hypertension called pulmonary arterial hypertension. And there are some patients who have scleroderma who have pulmonary hypertension that are slightly more complicated, either pulmonary hypertension related to another problem in the heart or pulmonary hypertension related to the fibrosis in the lungs. We don't know as much about these drugs in treating these groups, but people are starting to look at these groups, and we should have more information about how these drugs perform in patients who have these different variants of pulmonary hypertension. The area of lung disease and scleroderma is both pulmonary hypertension and this process pulmonary fibrosis. These are some pictures of what happens in those patients who have pulmonary fibrosis, where what should be a normal air-filled lungs develops both inflammation and scarring. These are, this is a picture of the inflammation that happens. And this is the result of what we see in somebody's lungs who develops this fibrosis, where there's this white scar tissue here uh, should not be here. This lung should look black like this. Again, we think that this is both a component of scarring and inflammation that causes this process. 
as of now, the only drug that we know to be beneficial for treating interstitial lung disease or this lung fibrosis is the drug called cytoxin or cyclophosphamide. This is based mainly on a study uh, in the U.S., although similar uh, data came out of the U.K. as well around the same time, called the Scleroderma Lung Study 1. This study looked at the drug cytoxin compared to a sugar pill in those patients who had scleroderma lung fibrosis and was a five-year study completed in 2005. This study included 158 patients from 13 different scleroderma centers in the United States. This slide depicts how well people did at one year comparing those who were treated with cytoxin to those who were treated with a sugar pill. And it's not important that you understand all of this, but know that people, each of these bars represents numbers of patients. People who were treated with cytoxin more often had improvement in their lung function, and people who were treated with the sugar pill more often had worsening of their lung function at one year. This is a very important study, both because uh, it set up the infrastructure to study um, scleroderma lung disease, and this study was sponsored by the National Institutes of Health, uh, but also was the first study to suggest that suppressing the immune system was helpful for treating scleroderma lung disease. We are currently uh, in the midst of the scleroderma lung study two. So if we know that suppressing the immune system is likely to benefit scleroderma lung disease, then we would like to use some of the uh, commonly used immune suppressing drugs and drugs that are a little bit easier to use than cytoxin. One of the big complications of cytoxin is that it is a very potent suppressor of the immune system, which can lead to some side effects, including lowering of the white blood cell count and therefore increasing risk of infection. And it has some other very specific risks associated with using this medication. So it would be really nice if we had a, another immune suppressing medicine that could do the same job. So right now we are in the midst of studying a new medication called Celsept. It's actually not a new medication. It's been around for a long time and is very often used to treat, um, to prevent rejection in those who have been treated with, uh, I'm sorry, those who have received a organ transplant. So the drug has been around for uh, 15 years or more now. Uh, and there's been some evidence that suggests that CELSEP may be beneficial to treat both the skin and the lung and scleroderma. So now this study is comparing the drug CELSEP for two years to the cytoxan drug, which we know is helpful for scleroderma lung disease, uh, for one year. This study has completed enrollment, so the last patients who are, were enrolled uh, a few months ago are still continuing to receive active treatment, and we are likely to receive some uh, information from this study, but not uh, for the next couple of years as patients finish out this trial and the data can be analyzed. But we think this is a very important study in our understanding of treatment for scleroderma lung fibrosis. The other component of the disease that involves both inflammation and fibrosis are those patients who have what we call early diffuse disease, uh, patients who have uh, the more severe subtype of skin disease. The rationale for treatment um, and the agents that we've looked at so far either have affected the infl inflammation part of scleroderma which we think is what's driving the problem in both the skin and the lung, that there is inflammation there. This inflammation causes the release of these signaling proteins or cytokines, and some of the therapy that we have studied so far involves directly affecting these cytokines. We think these cytokines are what's driving the formation of scar or fibrosis in both the skin or the lung. Uh, and this scar tissue comes from a cell called the fibroblast. These are all different areas where we could target in terms of therapy. In terms of immune suppressing medications, drugs that can 
uh, help suppress the inflammation that's driving the process. We have studied multiple drugs, uh, including what we discussed already, cyclophosphamide or cytoxin, uh, and mycophenolate mofetil or Celsept, and there is data suggesting that these drugs may be beneficial but for both the lung and the skin. I'm going to talk briefly about what's called high-dose immunosuppression or stem cell transplantation and some more targeted types of therapy for uh, the immune system. These proteins called cytokines can be targeted directly and these are the types of drugs that have been very effective in rheumatoid arthritis, uh, drugs that are targeting these cytokines. And these are the list of some of the very specific cytokines that are under study, and I'm going to talk about one specifically. We have also had some data about some therapy which may be antifibrotic, and I'll discuss one such study. To briefly touch on uh, the concept of very high-dose immune suppression, or what's called a stem cell transplant. The concept is that this process could reset the immune system. And this works by giving very high dose of immunosuppression, very high doses of cytoxin, which in these doses is considered to be chemotherapy. And then you either allow your bone marrow to recover after this on its own, or you replace it with your own stem cells to get your bone marrow to recover. There have been two large clinical trials, one in the United States, one in Europe, uh, comparing this type of treatment regimen to m more standard immune suppressing medicine with monthly IV cytoxin. This involved a regimen of very high doses of cytoxin and variably includes either total body radiation or other immune suppressing medications. And then again, followed by what's called stem cell rescue giving your own stem cells back to build up your bone marrow again. There has been initially high treatment-related toxicity and mortality, um, which has persisted in both of these clinical trials. What does that mean? That means that approximately 10% of the patients who were in these studies died from the treatment because this is very high-dose chemotherapy. But we are getting better in terms of improving these treatment regimens. There has not been any good data on this type of strategy for lung disease, but we are only now starting to get data from these two trials. And it appears that there is rapid response to the therapy, and both preliminary analyses from these studies have suggested that there is improvement in how somebody's skin responds to these treatments. One of the other problems besides the toxicity of the treatment itself has been there have been recurrences of active disease after somebody has gone through one of these protocols. So this is an area where we think the drugs actually are quite effective, but there is still much to be uh, improved in terms of the toxicity of the medication and what to do if somebody recurs after going through this very major uh, intensive type of treatment. One of the fibrotic medicines that has been studied is a drug called imatinib. Uh, this study had a lot of what's called preclinical data, so data from test tubes and data from animal models suggesting that this is a benefit. Unfortunately, what we know so far about these medications is that patients did not seem to tolerate these medications very well. Uh, and one of the big problems that we saw actually was a lot of swelling in, those pa in patients treated with this medication, which probably reduced our ability to see the effect on the skin. And this study, uh, which was a multicenter study, suggested that there was actually an increase in skin tightness in patients who were treated uh, with this medication. I think there's still a lot to be learned about this type of medication, uh, and there are newer generations of this type of medication that, have, that are being studied. I only have a couple of minutes left, but I wanted to touch on a couple of other areas. There is an ongoing study now for our, a, one of these anti-cytokine drugs. This is a drug called tocilizumab. This study, uh, the, sorry, this medication is approved to treat rheumatoid arthritis, and it is considered one of these anti-cytokine drugs. We know that this protein is elevated in the skin and blood and scleroderma, and this drug is currently in trials now, comparing a injection of this medication every week to a sugar pill injection, basically. 
uh, and this study is looking at the skin tightness at 24 weeks. This study has completed enrollment, and we are likely to have some preliminary results from this study probably in the next few months. The last area I said I would touch on briefly is related to gastrointestinal disease. The most commonly used medications to treat scleroderma gastroesophageal reflux or acid reflux or heartburn are the class of medicines called PPIs. A question that very often comes up to me when I'm seeing patients are what are the side effects of using these PPI medicines continuously? And the side effects from these medications are fairly well known. We know that there might be an increased risk of infection, particularly this issue called bacterial overgrowth, which is a bowel problem uh, which occurs fairly commonly in scleroderma, which can cause both um, bloating and cramping and diarrhea. And we think the risk probably is increased of this. Uh, so this is a potential concern. One of the big areas of concern has been, is there a possible increase in bone fracture and thinning of the bone in patients who are treated with this medication, these, this purple pill class of medication? Um, and the data on this has been kind of all over the map. Some studies suggesting that it does cause an increased risk in fracture and osteoporosis. Others suggest that it does not. I think for now what I'm counseling my patients is that this is a risk and benefit assessment. We have to weigh this small increase in risk of infection and possible changes in bone density to what we know is happening with these medications, that it is controlling the reflux, that it is preventing aspiration or um, trouble in the lung from acid reflux, and preventing probably this complication of acid reflux called Barrett's esophagus. So while this is an individual uh, decision between a patient and their physician, I think right now, because these risks, as best we know, are either not there or pretty small in magnitude, and we know that these things are benefited by using these medications, that for now we typically favor using these medications to treat the reflux and scleroderma. I'm going to end there but say that there has been really significant pro progress that continues uh, to occur for our understanding of the pathology, the natural history of the disease, and we really now have some exciting new treatments that are under trial. And this is likely to lead significant progress in multiple areas of scleroderma, including the lung, the um, pulmonary vascular disease, and the peripheral vascular disease in scleroderma. And there are many centers and consortium in place to better evaluate these therapies. I am going to end there, and I am going to look through some of the questions that are coming up on this chat window here. And Deanne, you can step in as well. Um, and see if we can answer some questions. Thank you, Laura. This is all excellent information for patients and others in the scleroderma community. So we have about 10 minutes left, and we can use that time to answer some of the questions that's come, that have come in already. And if you have a question, go ahead and type it into the chat box to the left of the main slideshow window. So I'm going to answer a question about the risk of kidney disease. Um, the question states, what is the risk of renal disease after five years uh, in patients with the RNA polymerase antibody? So we actually think almost all cases of scleroderma kidney disease, regardless of antibody, occur in the first three to four years of scleroderma. The risk beyond that is extremely small. So what I counsel patients is that when they are in the early part of the disease, if they have this antibody, that I ask them to check their blood pressure very regularly, at least three times per week. Once somebody is beyond that four-year window, I think we can become a little bit more lax in terms of how often we're watching, but I still ask patients to check their blood pressure about once a week just to catch that rare exception to the rule where somebody develops scleroderma kidney disease later. Hopefully that answers uh, Jennifer's question. I'm going to look at, I'm looking at another question again about the stem cell treatment. Again, this 
is what's called a stem cell transplantation, which means high dose immune suppressing medications followed by rescuing of your bone marrow by giving you your stem cells back. The studies thus far have uh, suggested that about 10% of patients have died from the treatment process itself. Uh, so it wasn't 10 people, but t about 10%. And that number has been fairly consistent across the multiple studies who have examined this type of treatment protocol. Laura, can you speak to the type of patients that, you know, the, the severity of disease in patients that have been admitted to these trials and how that may change as more information is gained? So most of these studies for um, these immune suppressing strategies uh, or these very intensive uh, immune suppressing strategies like stem cell transplantations have been patients who are early in disease. Uh, usually restricted to within the first couple of years of disease, and typically those who have the diffuse kind of skin disease, meaning widespread skin thickening. Um, in addition, patients have been restricted from inclusion in the study if they have severe dysfunction in, their, um, in other organ systems, like their lungs or their kidneys, um, just because we worry about their ability to tolerate this intensive type of therapy. The same type of inclusion is typically also true for uh, some of these other immune suppressing studies, some of the cytokine therapies, any of the drugs that are targeting patients with kind of early diffuse disease. Again, we are typically trying to enroll patients who are early on in the disease course who have active diffuse skin subtype. Does that make sense, Dan? Yes. Okay. Yes. There was a question about Raynaud phenomenon and the drugs that we talked about and who would be a candidate for those drugs. Um, the calcium channel blocker medications are the most commonly used drug to treat Raynaud phenomenon, and we would almost always use one of these medications uh, as first-line therapy. In patients who are not doing well on those medications, then we would consider using some of these other drugs that were mentioned. With the caveat that, at least in the United States, these drugs are not approved to treat Raynaud's phenomenon, uh, which means we may have uh, some trouble accessing these medications through an insurance company. But in patients who fail these traditional medicines, the calcium channel blockers, those are the patients that we would think about using some of these other drugs. Laura, um, for pulmonary arterial hypertension, you mentioned that there are different autoantibodies and different phenotypic markers that, that might allow grouping patients um, to more effectively target therapies to them. Are there, have there been any significant efforts or success in doing that to date? Not to date, but this is a pretty active area of research, particularly um, here. This is one of my very active areas of research. Uh, ideally, I would like to be able to predict with some degree of certainty, uh, based on some pretty simple tests, who is on their way to developing pulmonary hypertension. And then the question would be, when would we start therapy in patients who look like they have, with a pretty high degree of certainty, a high risk of developing pulmonary hypertension in the next few years? Would we then extend some of the therapy that we have to that subgroup? There hasn't been a huge amount of progress in this area, but it's something we're very interested in studying further. In pulmonary hypertension in general, the question uh, often comes up because we're better about screening patients for looking for pulmonary hypertension, when should we initiate therapy? Because we're actually recognizing pulmonary hypertension in some patients who don't have symptoms. And currently the medications are approved to treat patients who have symptomatic pulmonary hypertension. So I think this is gonna be a step in between this where we would potentially start therapy even before somebody develops symptoms in the hopes of preventing them from developing uh, symptoms down the line. Right, that would be great. How do you think about 
the combination therapy in pulmonary hypertension, and do you see changes in that with these new agents coming online? Yeah, this is an area where there's multiple trials going on about either adding one class of medication onto those who are treated with another class or starting combination therapy from the beginning. Uh, I think we don't know yet too much. The studies have suggested adding one class onto another is likely of some benefit. Now, whether we should have an approach where you very aggressively treat somebody up front, potentially with combination therapy versus adding on therapies if patients aren't responding adequately to one drug or another, that we don't know yet. But people are very interested in this and uh, starting to look at the different variations of um, upfront combination versus, combina you know, kind of an additive approach. Um, so I think we're only going to learn more and more over the next few years about how practically to use these medications in combination. Terrific. We have a question about um, the correlation between telangiectasias and the risk for pulmonary hypertension. Uh, actually, this was a study that we performed here at Johns Hopkins where we actually uh, counted telangiectasias. So telangiectasias, for those of you who don't know, are these little dilated blood vessels that can occur on the face or in the mouth or on the hands of patients with scleroderma. We had recognized that some of our patients who had severe pulmonary hypertension seemed to have a dramatic number of telangiectasias. Uh, so we did a study where we counted the telangiectasias uh, in patients with scleroderma, and then we saw if there was a correlation uh, with that and pulmonary hypertension. And we found that there was a pretty strong correlation between um, the number of telangiectasias that somebody had and the chance that they had pulmonary hypertension. So why would that be? Uh, what we think is happening is that as somebody is developing um, a severe vascular problem in scleroderma like pulmonary hypertension, that your uh, blood vessels may be sending signals saying that they're getting damaged. And this may lead to abnormal blood vessel formation in other parts of the body. We don't know that for sure, uh, so that's a theory. Um, but it makes sense based on what we know about what's happening in pulmonary hypertension. Terrific. Um, you showed an interesting slide on the um, SLS1 study, and there's been some talk about, um, or some interest in talk about the uh, use of cyclophosphamide in terms of its benefit versus its toxicity. And given the, the, the potential for toxic effects, how does that influence your decision to use it in combination with the, the data from the SLS1 study, showing the, the modest benefit? Yeah, I do think that's a very important question that doesn't have a simple uh, answer. So the SLS1 study suggested that patients who are treated with cytoxin uh, had more improvement in their lung function. So they had a slight improvement in lung function, whereas those who were on the sugar pill had a slight decline in lung function. But the magnitude of that difference was fairly small. You can interpret that one of a few ways. Uh, one, that the, that the drug may only have a limited benefit. Uh, the way I see this study in terms of its design was that there were a large number of patients in this study who really had no change in their lung function over time. And that probably means that we're still not great at choosing the right person for being in these clinical trials. You know, if you were in a, the sugar pill arm of the study and you had no change in your lung function over time, maybe that means that you weren't going to develop any uh, progression in your lung disease to begin with. So I think that's actually probably the biggest reason why there wasn't a bigger difference uh, in this study, uh, comparing those who got the cytoxin to those who got the sugar pill. Now, that being said, I think that suggests that this strategy and this type of treatment regimen likely is beneficial if you can correctly determine who should get the therapy. I think that's where we need to uh, understand the disease better in terms of who is at the highest risk for having their lung disease progress and then try and target the treatments better to that group meaning really only expose the patients to that kind of toxic medication if they're really at high risk for having their disease progress. Now, we would love to do that with a less potentially toxic medication, uh, something like mycophenolate or Celsept, 
um, but and we should know information more information about that once SLS2 uh, is completed. Well, we're just about out of time, and I'd like to thank Dr. Hummers and the Johns Hopkins Scleroderma Center for her time today, and each of you who joined us today. Remember that this and all other webinars are available for free download on our website. We're all a part of the scleroderma community, and only by joining together can we make faster progress in the search for better treatments and a cure. When you close the webinar window, you can provide helpful information back to the Scleroderma Research Foundation by completing the short survey. Please remember that we depend on your support to continue our investment in the most promising research. You can visit us at sclerodermaresearch.org or call our offices at 1-800-441-CURE, C-U-R-E, to support our program and learn more about the SRF, our webinar series, and how you can become more involved. Thank you very much, and goodbye for now. Bye-bye.